Good morning. Welcome to Various Grove this morning. Everybody doing okay? Can I get another good morning? Good morning. All right. That's much more better. Now I know everybody's listening. How about let's stand up and sing How Great Thou Art? Amen? All right. We're waiting for you.
pray to see this morning. Amen. Let's continue with your love defends him. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all here today. I want to welcome you to Barry's Grove Baptist Church. We're glad that you are here. If you're a guest of ours today, we thank you for being with us. Hope that you got a welcome packet that tells you a little bit about us. And uh, we'd love for you to tell us a little bit about you. So if you'd fill out that card, drop it off in the offering plate on your way out today. We'd appreciate it. But we're glad you're here. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have blessed us with to gather together as your people and worship you. Lord, you are great and greatly to be praised. And we thank you for loving us. Lord, for looking down upon us when we were yet sinners and your enemies and sending your son to die for us. Lord, it is truly beyond our comprehension what kind of love you have for us. 
But Lord, we are thankful and we pray that today as we meet with you in worship, Lord, that we would, Lord, we would just get a glimpse of how great you are. Lord, that we would grow more in love with you through what we see in your word, that we may leave this place with a desire to tell others about how good you are. So, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in everything that is done, in the songs that are sung, in the words that are spoken. And, Lord, we just give you praise for what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen. I appreciate your prayers for me this past week as I was preaching in revival at Old Lee Bethel Baptist Church. I, I pray that it went well. We had a good, uh, good turnout and seemed to get, have good feedback, but uh, great, great congregation out there, and it was a blessing to be with them. But I appreciate your prayers. Eric? Uh, preached on the church at, uh, the letter to the church in Sardis last week out of Revelation 3, 1 through 6. Did a fine job. I went back and watched that message. And uh, his memory verse was only, he, he, cut, you, he cut you some slack last week because he only, only made you do the first half of Revelation 3, 3. So let's see if you can say that with me. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. Good words, very short, very easy to remember, and a good reminder of us about how important God's Word is for us, uh, that we would receive it, hear it, keep it, and repent when necessary. So we're continuing in Revelation 3 today, looking at the letter to the church in Philadelphia. That's the Philadelphia in Asia Minor, not Pennsylvania. But uh, the, uh, the church there uh, had a much different... Um, letter from the one to the church in Sardis. That church in Sardis, Jesus says, you got a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Well, the church in Philadelphia was not dead. They were very much alive, and, uh, and God was doing some great things through them, but they were suffering some pretty severe persecution. But Jesus tells them, as we'll see when we look at that today, that he was going to use their suffering for him and their witnessing for him to draw people to himself. And uh, so uh, Jonathan's going to come today, and he's going to have our Old Testament reading out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. I was reading Jeremiah this morning. It's in my head. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 45. Uh, we're we're going to see the promise that God made then that, uh, that we see uh, we're reminded of today in Revelation 3. Good morning. As Craig just said and gave me a mini heart attack, we will not be in Jeremiah. <laughs> we will be in Isaiah. Uh, so if you have a copy of the scriptures, you could turn to Isaiah 45. If you're using one of the Black Pew Bibles in front of you, it's on page 642. Have you seen the news? recently? Do you pay attention to what's going on globally? Have you talked to anyone about the world today? If you have at all, that probably invokes a small amount of emotion, perhaps a large amount of emotion. Maybe not as much emotion as I'm feeling as my device that I depend on too heavily doesn't load in front of me right now. But our world is I'm going to say always in a state of chaos, to say it nicely. Uh, I understand the sentiment of, you know, it maybe wasn't like this when I was a certain age, or maybe these days aren't like those days. But I think if we're, if we're honest, if we could talk to all people that have lived at all times, the world has never been where we would want it. And that, in fact, just lines up very clearly with what Scripture says about the world. It makes us ask questions, makes us wonder, makes me wonder. And maybe you've asked the question, where is God in all this? What's he doing? Is he doing? Is he going to do something? Do we know about Peter Watlin? I trust we don't. I didn't. In the 90s, glorious age that they were, uh, Peter was a British farmer in Britain. And so he's doing his business. He's farming, and he loses his hammer. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing in the field with a hammer, maybe fencing. 
but he loses his hammer, and this is important. So he calls a friend who owns a metal detector and says, hey man, you gotta help me out. Apparently I, I need this one hammer. Can you help me find it? Well, they don't find it. They instead find a collection of gold jewels, silver spoons, coins, treasure, valued at how much you ask? Four million dollars. They estimate it's been sitting there since maybe the fourth century. This whole time, under his feet, how many times has he walked across that pasture? How many people have been there and this treasure has just been sitting there buried? Let's have one more quick story from history if we can. In 1844, a man takes a trip to Cairo, Egypt. Uh, while he's there, he visits St. Catherine's Monastery, which sits at the foot of Mount Sinai, uh, supposedly built at the location of the burning bush. I'm not sure how they'd know that, but apparently that's where it is. Uh, this young man's name is Constantine von Tinschendorf. If you're going to have kids soon, I'd highly recommend this as a considerable name. <laughs> Jacqueline, number four? No? Okay. And while he's there uh, talking to the monks and looking around, he finds in a bin that's used to hold kindling for the fire 129 parchment leaves. And upon observing and, and looking at them, he realizes they are not kindling. They are pages of scripture. They are very old copies of the Septuagint, which is the Greek copy of the Old Testament that for some unknown period of time and volume had been used to stoke the fire there when it was cold. So he, of course, grabs them up uh, and in talking to the monks, asks if he can keep them. They, like you and I would upon cleaning the couch, realize something of value has been unfortunately misplaced. And they say, you can't, you can't have all of them, but you can have some of them. Uh, he takes 43 of them. And then over the years, he comes back trying to find the rest or trying to get his hands on the rest, trying to find more. Uh, he's not really able to do that. But on his last trip, he meets with a monk in his room, and he shows the monk his copy, uh, his Greek copy of the Old Testament, his copy of the Septuagint. And the monk says, well, actually, uh, I have a copy of that too. And he pulls out a red cloth-bound, 347-leaf parchment copy of the Septuagint, hundreds of years old, uh, from around the early 300s. Um, and it is now called or referred to as the Codex Sinaiticus, the one of the most complete and oldest copies of the scripture we have. When we say things like, we can trust this, this is reliable, we're saying that in part because we have this document that we can look back to and say, look, uh, when translated correctly, it matches this. So when you meet with someone who says the ridiculous nonsense, like, oh, you know, just a, a bunch of white people changed this in the 1400s, you can say, well, I don't know how they could since we have a copy from 300 that matches this identically. But prior to Constantine finding it, it's sitting in a bin to be burned. I want us to think about that as we turn to the text of Isaiah. Chapter 45, verse 14. This is what the Lord says, the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, will come over to you and will be yours. They will follow you. They will come down over in chains and bow down to you. They will confess to you, God is indeed with you, and there is no other. There is no other God. Yes, you are a God who hides, God of Israel, Savior. All of them are put to shame, even humiliated. The makers of idols go in humiliation together. Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will not be put to shame or humiliated for all eternity. For this is what the Lord says the creator of the heavens, the God who formed the earth and made it, the one who established it. He did not create it to be a wasteland, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret somewhere in a land of darkness. I did not say to the descendants of Jacob, seek me in a wasteland. I am the Lord who speaks righteously, who declares what is right. Come, Gather together and approach, you fugitives of the nations. Those who carry their wooden idols and pray to a God who cannot save have no knowledge. God who cannot save have no knowledge. Speak up and present your case. Yes, let them consult each other. Who predicted this long ago? Who announced it from ancient times? Was it not I, the Lord? There is no other God but me, 
a righteous God and Savior. There is no one except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, truth has gone from my mouth, a word that will not be revoked. Every knee will bow to me, every tongue will swear allegiance. It will be said about me, righteousness and strength are found only in the Lord. All who are enraged against him will come to him and be put to shame. All the descendants of Israel will be justified and find glory through the Lord. The Lord is the Lord of all the earth. And this is good news. God is fairly clear here that he is not a local or a tribal deity. He's not the God of America or the God of the South. He's not in competitions of other gods of other places. He is God, and he says there is no other. We talk about being monotheistic. We don't just mean we worship one God out of the choices, like a smathering of stuff on a target shelf. There is one, and we worship him. Yes. This is good news. And he's the God who is the creator. He says that clearly here. Isaiah says that the Lord did not form the earth to be empty or useless. He formed it for purpose. This is good news. But he is not worshipped or acknowledged globally. We know this. I think in part this is the reason for the troubles that we see in the news or when we talk to our friends. In fact, this is treasonous. The king's subjects do not give attention to him. They don't honor him. This is evident by the way we treat creation, by our conscience. The world's in open rebellion against him. And since the days of Babel, we have been out to make a name for ourselves and not a name for the Lord. This is, this is bad news. But this is also tragic. Many do not know of him. Even those who reject him or those who are ignorant of him both share a terrible fate. They need to know that he is the only savior. They need good news. And it says here that God does not appear to all people, and neither does he speak audibly day by day to everyone. So there is a sense, like Isaiah says, that he is hidden. It's a weird statement, isn't it? How can a man say that God is hidden? I mean, I can only play hide and seek if I know there are people and who those people are hiding, right? I have to know who's there to be hiding if I can say someone's hiding. Isaiah has to know that God is there so he can say God is hidden. Does that make sense? <laughs> but God does hide himself in a way. But not necessarily in a hide-and-seek way. There is the way, like 2 Corinthians 4 says, that Satan has blinded the eyes of the lost. I don't have to be very good at hide-and-seek if I'm playing with someone who has no eyesight. I just have to be quiet. But there's an even deeper sense. Perhaps God is hidden from the world because of me. Perhaps someone watches my life and has reason to think there must not be a God to turn to. Perhaps even though I would proclaim something with my mouth, maybe I walk around like the people in Isaiah's testimony here carrying wooden idols that have no value. Maybe my actions do not display the reality of a God who saves the nations. So I have to ask, is that true of myself? Is that true of us? Or do we display it vividly and boldly for the world to see? God is a great treasure. Amen? God is a treasure like Jesus describes in the parable of a man who stumbles upon him in the field and says, sells all he has to gain it. But yet, many have yet to stumble upon this treasure. God, like the British farmer's fortune, like the ancient pages of scripture, in a sense, lie there, valuable, priceless, but hidden, maybe even in plain sight. Will we listen to Isaiah? Will we join in this call to the nations to bring the gospel to the lost? This is a promise that Isaiah gives. The nations will respond to the Lord. The nations will hear that he is a good savior. Will we be a part of that? Will we participate in this mission so people can turn from their worthless ways and find the true savior? Let's pray.
Father, we need to hear the words of the scriptures this morning. Lord, I need to hear. I need to be reminded that there is no one apart from you. That you are the great God. You are the Lord. You are the creator. There is no savior. There is no hope for me or for us or for anyone apart from you, apart from your son. Lord, you know our testimony might be that we seek many things other than you. And the Lord, in that we confess and we plead for forgiveness, we repent of that. God, we long to live in a way that brings glory and joy to you. God, we long to live in a way that when the nations look and see us, they see a clear and undiminished reflection of yourself, that they would see you in your glory, they would set down their worthless idols, they would set down their worthless pursuits, and they would turn to you. So God, we ask that you would help us do that, that we would put down the things that we idolize and the things that we chase after. God, you are a great treasure. For those of us that have found it, we know this to be true and unequaled in the world. Help us, Lord, to match that. Help us, Lord, to live that out. Forgive us when we don't. And Lord, we long to see this promise brought to fruition that those nearby and those from distant lands will hear the call of the gospel, respond to Christ the Son, and worship you forever. And there will be none other, only you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Continue worship this morning. This is one of our favorite songs. I think you guys have liked it in the past as well. Build my life. Please stand and join us.
this morning, build your life on him. Amen. And now, our song of the month. A song in my soul, I hope a song in your soul as well. There's a song in my soul, and I feel it stirring in me. This I know for sure, that your love is like a flood, and your mercy never ending. I give my song to you. There's a joy in my soul, and it rises like the morning. This I know for sure, that your grace is enough, and your promise never breaks. Thank you, praise team. I hadn't heard that song before, but I like it. I see we got the Phil Wickham theme going on. He writes good songs. He writes real good songs. All right. I'm going to test your knowledge of ancient history. See if you recognize this theme song. 
Here I come to save the day. Mighty Mouse. You just showed your age right there, didn't you? That's right. Mighty Mouse. You know, I couldn't stand that cartoon. I really, I, I couldn't stand it. You know, now, but I went back and I, I, I listened to the whole theme song that opened up the cartoon. And it, it, it had a good message. It says, when you hear this mighty sound, here I come to save the day, that means that Mighty Mouse is on the way. Yes, sir, when there is a wrong to right, Mighty Mouse will join the fight. That's great. You know, he would come in and rescue those poor little lambs before the wolves got them. It was just amazing. But I couldn't stand him because he was just so cocky, you know? He just, I was always hoping he'd lose, but he never did. You know what we need is a real hero. We don't need some little mouse in a funny suit that comes announcing his presence and flying in to save the day like that. We don't need one that has to sing a song about how great he is while he's doing it. You see, when Jesus returns, we know that he will save us. He will vanquish all those who oppose him and those who stand for his message. But I want you to understand something today. Until he comes, it will be hard for us. It will be hard for us. Jesus made it very clear that things would get harder up until the time of his return. People will be hostile, hostile to our gospel witness. I think we've seen that. Very much so in the day and times in which we live. But I want you to understand something. Knowing that help is on the way gives us strength to be faithful and bold as we represent him here. Yes. He has not left us and forgotten about us. And we know that he will come and save us. So when we struggle with the direction in which the world is going and we feel as though everyone is against us and that we can't possibly make a difference, we need only to remember that Jesus is in control of our circumstances and he is preparing everything for his return to rescue us. Amen. Folks, that's good news. That's good news. God didn't just save you and leave you here to yourself and say, good luck, hope it works out. He's got a plan that he is working out. So if you're struggling to keep going with all the trouble going on around you, I hope you will listen to the message that Jesus gave to the church of Philadelphia. Do you feel sometimes like you're just wasting your time trying to stand for truth and warn other people about the danger that they're in? Sometimes it feels that way. But I want you to keep persevering in the fight because Jesus is in control and help is on the way. So let's read our passage out of Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the True One, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Before we pray, why don't we read the memory verse together. Verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to hold on. Help us to hold on in the midst of a world that seems like it's falling apart. And help us not just to hold on, but to advance your kingdom. Lord, may we truly 
seek to be your witnesses no matter what trials we may face with the confidence that you are coming back to rescue us. In Jesus' name, amen. In this letter to Philadelphia, Jesus gives us two promises of assurance that we can hold on to in difficult times. First, he will open doors for us to make a difference in our world for his kingdom. Now, the church of Philadelphia was located some 100 miles east of Smyrna. It was situated on a plateau. So it was a fortress city on an imperial trade route that was uh, designated as a place to disseminate the Greek language to the eastern part of the Roman Empire. It was a strong church. It outlasted all the other churches that we see in the book of Revelation. In fact, it is known that there was a continuous church there all the way up until 1392. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. So over 1,300 years, this church existed without ever ceasing to exist, even though it was undergoing serious persecution in the 90s. And I don't mean the 1990s, I mean the 90s, right? So then we know that there were still, even after the original church ceased to exist, there were other churches that were planted, and at the turn of the 20th century, there were still five congregations that were known to be active. Now, they've ceased now, as far as we know. But if a church could continue to exist in a place of such serious persecution, then we could probably learn a little bit from them. Jesus identifies himself as holy and true. He's the one who is set apart from all others, and his word is completely reliable. You know, when he speaks to us, and how does he speak to us? He speaks to us primarily through his word. He speaks to us through prayer. He speaks to us through other believers, and he speaks to us through our circumstances. But this is where we hear his word most clearly. And so when he speaks to us, we should listen. We should give more credence to what he says than to all the competing voices of the world. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I preached this message on Wednesday night at the, in the revival. And the funny thing was, is that very night... As I was getting ready to preach, somebody's phone went off. And I thought, the competing voices have made it inside the building, <laughs> right? Because isn't that the case? We spend more time on our phones or on TV or listening to whatever we can find on podcasts than we do actually listening to God. We give more credence to what we hear all around us than we give to what God is actually saying to us. Folks, that's why we're in so much danger. We're in danger because we're not listening to what he has to say. Well, what he has to say, first of all, is it's a quote from the book of Isaiah in regard to how he holds the key uh, to the kingdom. He says there in verse uh, 7, the one who has the key of David. Now, when he's talking about the key of David, he is quoting from Isaiah as well, Isaiah 22, 22, I think. And what he's talking about there is the key to David is the key to the kingdom of God because from David would come forth the Messiah. So he's saying he holds the key to the kingdom of God. And what he's doing is he's opening the door wide to this kingdom. He says, who opens and no one will close and who closes and no one opens. So he had opened this door wide and he says that no one can close it. He says, look, I placed before you an open door, but no one can close it. Now, what is this open door that he's talking about? Obviously, it has to do with the kingdom. It's an open door to the kingdom. What does it refer to? Well, in its most basic meaning, it would describe the fact that we as a church have access to the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. That much is clear. But almost every time the word the words open and door are used together in the New Testament, it refers to opportunities for missions. So look here, Colossians 4, 3, Paul says at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. First Corinthians 16, 9, he says, because a wide door for effective ministry has opened for me, yet many oppose me. In 2 Corinthians 2, again, he talks about it. He says, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though the Lord opened a door for me, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find my brother Titus. And he goes into some personal things there. 
But I want you to see three different times we see open door. It's referring to opportunities to take the gospel somewhere that it has not been received. So God opens doors for us. God opens doors for us to make a difference in the world around us. If we're listening to him, he will show us where those opportunities are. Now, that does not mean that just because there's an opportunity that people will embrace it. So you go on down a little bit further there in 2 Corinthians 2, and he says, For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life who is adequate for these things. And what he's saying is some people will hear our message and think it's the sweetest thing they've ever heard, and there will be others that will think that it sounds like death. Right. So bottom line is, even if God opens a door for us, even if he gives us an opportunity for the gospel to advance the kingdom of God, people will not necessarily be excited that we have come to them to tell them the truth. And so what he tells us here is that they were being persecuted. Look at what he says. He says that... You know, you've kept my word and have not denied my name. He says, but yet you have but little power. I want, I want you to think about this. They're, they had stood for the gospel in a place where they were a very small church in a place of great wickedness. He says, you don't have much power. And you feel that way in our world sometimes? Yeah. You know, we want to stand for what's true and what's right, and we want to be faithful to the Lord, and we feel like everybody and everything is against us. He says, you don't have much power. He says, you, you, you don't have much power, but you've been faithful. You haven't denied my name. And so he says, look, those from the synagogue of Satan, remember we've already heard that was used back, I guess, in the letter to Smyrna. He talks about the synagogue of Satan and the Jews who claim to be Jews but aren't really Jews because they were actually serving Satan and not serving God. He says, he says I'm going to bring them and they're going to worship. He says, I'll make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. Isn't that something? Even though they're persecuting now and they're killing your people now, I am going to draw them to myself where they're going to come and they're going to worship me. And they're going to see that I have really loved you. And they're going to see that love is found in Christ alone and not through their practice of the law in the synagogue. Now, it's a real interesting thing to think about that he could take a situation of persecution and he could turn it into an opportunity for worship. But I think it's real interesting when we think about it in the context of what the day and age is that we live in with the world revolting in mass against God and his truth. That rather than taking a bunker mentality and coming in between these four walls and, and just hoping that the world won't come and get us, that we would go out with confidence and faith in Christ that he's going to open doors for us and that even if we do experience persecution, even if people do reject our message, that some will be saved. Yes. Folks, we have to have a holy boldness for Jesus. And as long as we are here, and as long as we are faithful, as long as we do not deny his name, he will open doors for us to be a witness. But we have to take advantage of those opportunities. Amen. How many opportunities do we miss in life? You know, I was literally sitting there thinking about opportunities that I had missed in my life in different things, not just in witnessing, in different things. You go back, a lot of people just live with regret. I just move on. I'm not, a, I'm not the kind of person who lives in the past and worries about things I did before. I know whatever I did that was sinful, I've asked for forgiveness, God's forgiven it, I don't worry about it. But you do look back sometimes and you wonder, I wonder what would have happened in my life if I had done this, right? What if I had gone in this direction when I was in school or with this job? Or if I had seized this opportunity that God had given me? And you know, those opportunities pass us by. We can't bring them back. We can imagine in our minds what they might have been like. At the end of the day, it's okay though. We can live with it. But I want you to understand something. When we miss an opportunity to Share the gospel with somebody. That door may close forever. You ever thought about that? You might be the last chance a person has to hear the gospel while they're on this earth. 
And when we aren't paying attention to the opportunities that God presents to us on a daily basis, we could be letting people head down a road to hell. All because we weren't paying attention. Because we weren't listening to God. We weren't looking for what he wanted us to do. And you know, I think about the danger in that. Ezekiel 3.18, God said, If I say to the wicked person, you will surely die, but you do not warn him, you don't speak out to warn him about his wicked way in order to save his life. That wicked person will die for his iniquity, yet I will hold you responsible for his blood. The blood is on our hands. If we know that someone is destroying their life, that they have rejected the gospel and they've gone in the wrong direction, and if God opens the door for us to talk to them and we don't warn them, we bear guilt. Folks, that's a scary thing to think about. You know, I read an interesting <clears throat> story years ago, and I've shared it from this pulpit, but I have to share it again because it was just so powerful to me. It's about uh, a video that was put out several years ago by Penn Juliet. Penn is half of the magic act in Las Vegas, the uh, Penn and Teller. He's an outspoken atheist. But after one of his shows, a fan came up to him and gave him a Bible and shared his testimony with him. He even marked some scriptures in the Bible for him. Now, Penn later recorded a video, and, and he admitted that it did not change his mind. But this is what he said. He said, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. We would say witness. He says proselytize. If you believe there is a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? And I thought that atheist understands better than most Christians I know. That if you know people are going to hell, and you won't tell them about the danger that they're in, that's a horrible, horrible thing that even an atheist could understand is wrong. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we look out at the world and we see the mess, we see how messed up people are, right? And people are messed up. Heard a story about somebody who was messed up earlier that some of our folks encountered recently. But how often do we look at that person and we go, that's a person that was created in the image of God that is on the way to hell unless somebody tells them, unless somebody warns them. And what if God opens an up, up an opportunity for me to tell them and I pass it by because it'll be either A, socially awkward, or B, it, it just, I don't like them and I don't want to tell them. How hateful is that? Folks, I'm, I'm telling you what, we bear a great responsibility for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And regardless of the social awkwardness or the danger it may put us in, we cannot go through this life with our mouths closed. Because at the end of the race, if we are found to have failed to pass through those doors that God has opened for us, we will be guilty before God. He will not take it lightly. Folks, I, I think about the only two churches that were really commended in these seven letters. Now, there were other minor commendations. It was because they had been faithful to be a witness in the midst of a difficult place where persecution and death were inevitable. Folks, I'm afraid we can't even witness when things are okay. I mean, let's face it, we don't really suffer great persecution here. And yet, for some reason, we just don't want to upset anybody or ruin a friendship or look weird by telling them about Jesus. That's a problem. That's a problem. And I do believe that the Bible makes it clear. Jesus says, if you won't confess me before men, then I will not confess you before my Father in heaven. So I think it's very important that we examine ourselves to see how we're doing in this area. Folks, are you taking advantage of the opportunities that God is giving to you? Or are you too afraid of offending someone or ruining a relationship? Is it worth saving your reputation or your social standing or your friendship? 
and miss out on giving a chance for them to hear about eternal life through Jesus Christ. Folks, I want you to understand something. If he opens the door for you, he's going to equip you to walk through that door. Amen. Do not miss the opportunities. Be listening to what God is saying. Keep your eyes open to see what he's doing. And then be faithful and obedient to go where he leads you. Second, he will come soon to rescue us from this world and deliver us into his kingdom. He will come soon to rescue us from this world and deliver us into his kingdom. Here's the good news. If... You go through the open door and you tell somebody about the gospel and they reject it. They reject you. They end up persecuting you. They even end up killing you. Don't worry. He's going to rescue you. It'll be okay. That's hard for us to believe, isn't it? Hard for us to understand. And it's all about where we think of as being our home. Is my home here or is my home with Christ? You know, if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, and we're going to fully experience all that God has for us as believers, obedience is required and obedience is costly. You know, Jesus didn't say, if you want to follow me, come on along and it'll be a great ride. He said, if you want to follow me, you got to deny yourself and take up your cross. Taking up your cross means that you are willing to die. First of all, you're going to die to yourself absolutely into all your dreams and goals and desires but second there's a very good possibility you could die for your beliefs i mean all but one of the apostles was martyred only john wasn't martyred and he was exiled to a island by himself man if you go back and you read the history of the early church it was just a constant state of persecution and martyrdom for them until Constantine became the emperor and made the whole kingdom Christian, which really weakened the church. That's a whole other story for church history, and that's another day, right? You know, the church has thrived best in places where there was persecution rather than where there was just freedom. Sad to say, because we're not good with freedom. We're not good with freedom. The church in Philadelphia, it was small, it was insignificant, and the world around them despised the gospel they proclaimed, but they were obedient to God's call, and he commended them for it. And Jesus promised them if they would endure the persecution they received for being obedient, he would protect them from the judgment that he was going to bring on the whole earth, right? So he says... Because, verse 10, because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole earth to test those who live on the earth. And of course, he's talking about the return of Christ, the great tribulation, the end of the world, the judgment that was coming on the lost. He says, I'm going to protect you from that. You're not going to have to endure that. You know, the problem with that statement, though, is that little word, soon. Soon. Look at, look, look at what he says. He says, because you've kept my command, I will also keep from the hour of testing. It's going to come on the whole world. And I didn't get to it. Verse 11, I am coming soon. Soon. He says, don't worry. He says, I'll keep you from the hour of testing and I'll, I'll be there soon. That was written 1900 years ago. You know, I want you to think about it in the Bible when we think about soon. Paul thought Jesus was coming soon. He thought he would come in his lifetime. He didn't. Right? He promised that Jesus was coming soon to the people there at the Church of Philadelphia. That church doesn't even exist anymore. You know, I think about the end of the book of Revelation. John ends the book by saying, He who testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. He goes, Amen, come on. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. He still hasn't come. But look at that last line of the book. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. Folks, what I, what I want you to understand is that we need his grace to sustain us in the work until he fulfills his promise to come back and make everything right. Whenever that might be. And his soon is not the same as our soon. You know, I remind you of a passage I quote quite regularly here. 
2 Peter 3, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Soon to him is not the same as soon to us. So why does he delay his coming? The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So what is the reason Jesus hasn't returned yet? Even though he said he was coming soon, why is it that he hasn't come yet to rescue us from this cesspool that we're living in? Because he wants people to be saved. And we're here to help them find Christ. That's it. That's it. And if it requires our suffering and even our death, he says, that's okay. Because I've got you. I've got you. I'm going to take care of you. You don't have to worry about it. So Jesus' delay should not cause us to doubt the truth of his word. It should not cause us to worry and fret and try to figure out the day when he's coming back. But that we should recognize that this delay is given to us as an opportunity, an open door. So that more people might be saved and come into the kingdom. And by his grace... We can rest in the assurance he will come back when he sees fit and that we will be rewarded for our faithfulness, whether we're still here or whether we've already gone on to be with the Lord and return with him on that great day. So until he comes, we, like the members of the church in Philadelphia, must hold on to what we have so that no one takes our crown. Hold on. He used that term hold on in one of the other letters. And I think it was Smyrna as well. I think he told them to hold on. It was one of those churches. His point was, hold on. Well, what would they have? Nothing but Jesus. We're holding on to what our faith is. That's all we've got. We hold on by trusting in Jesus and being obedient even when life gets hard. But here's the thing. When we fail to be the salt and light in a decaying and dark world, we let Satan rob us of the crown of life that Jesus bestowed upon us. By his death and resurrection. When we fail to be obedient, we trade our eternal riches for worldly treasures that don't last. Question is, are we truly preparing for the return of Christ? Or are we just comfortable with our life here? Because that's the scary part. Matthew um, 6, 19-21 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you buy, oh, no, that's not it. It's supposed to be Matthew 6, not Matthew 16. Um, Matthew 6, starting in verse 19, says this. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Folks, when we invest our lives in what truly matters, and uh, it lets us know where our hope is. But folks, if our lives are focused on just building up what we have here on this earth, it lets people know what we really care about. And it lets Jesus know especially. Folks, we're going to lack stability in our faith if we're not living out our faith in the way that God intended us. I spend so much time talking to people that struggle with whether they're saved or not, whether they're going to heaven or not. And it's because we're not being obedient to what God has called us to do. And if we're not living in obedience to him, then we don't have assurance of a relationship with him because his presence and his power is not at work in our lives. So it's time that we recognize that if we truly love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. And what is his commandment? Primarily, it's to go and make disciples. And if we're missing that, then we're missing out on the boat of what it really means to be a Christian. We're missing out on what our purpose is here, and we're going to begin to lose faith in what Jesus is going to do to rescue us. There are too many like that. Folks, when we put our energy into obeying God and laying up treasures in heaven rather than looking for earthly rewards, we'll have security in God's grip of grace. Verse 12 tells us this. 
It says, the one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. There's a lot in there. You know, the whole idea of being a pillar was a sturdy, sturdy pillar in the middle of a building, right? That, that it, it, it's, it's, there, it's there for stability purposes. It's, it's, it's strong. It's not going anywhere. You can't just push a pillar over. And it's interesting that he says that they would never go out again of the temple. Well, we've got to understand the history of Philadelphia. It was a, it was a city that was uh, completely destroyed multiple times by earthquakes. And so the people decided they weren't going to live in the city because it was too dangerous. If there was an earthquake, the buildings and the walls would fall down on them. So they lived in the countryside. They would just come into the city to do business, and then they would go back to their homes in the countryside. God says, I'm going to give you stability right in the middle of my house, and you're never going to have to leave again. He says, and I'm going to mark you as my own. I'm going to put my name on you. I'm going to put the name of my city on you, and I'm going to put my son's new name on you. All of that, everything, everyone is going to know that you are mine, and I'm never going to let go of you. What a precious promise. Isn't it good to know that he's never going to let go, no matter what happens? You know, it makes me think of what Jesus said in John 10. He said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Folks, eternal life is secure for his sheep. No matter what happens to us here, we're safe in the hand of God until the time that Jesus returns to rescue us and deliver us to our eternal home. doesn't matter what anybody does to us. That's why we're free to go out and be a witness for him. Because we have security. You know, many of you will remember we did a, um, we had a musical here several, quite a few years ago now called Experiencing God. And there was a video clip in that, exp in that musical and it was a story of a, an Olympic runner named Derek Redmond. Now, Derek Redmond, was, he had actually set the uh, British record in the 400-meter race in the mid-1980s. But he had to pull out of the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea because of an Achilles injury. But he worked his way back from that. He was considered the favorite for the 400-meter race in Barcelona in 1992. He won his quarterfinal race. And in the semifinal race, he started strong. But about halfway through... He pulled up with a hamstring injury. He had torn his hamstring. He ended, up on the, he ended up on the racetrack. Trainers are coming out there. They're trying to get him up. And he knew his Olympic dream was over, but he had decided he was going to finish that race. And so he got up and he started trying to run like that. And he was struggling and he was crying and people were trying to get him off the track and he wouldn't get off the track. And then all of a sudden this person comes down out of the stands and starts running to him. And you know, security officials are trying to keep him away, and he's brushing them off, and he's running towards this guy, and it was his father, Jim Redman. And Jim Redman came out there, and he put his arm around him. He tried to get him to stop running before he hurt himself, tried to get him to just stop and see the trainers, and, and, and Derek Redman told him he wanted to finish that race. His dad said, okay, we started this thing together, and now we'll finish it together. And so he wrapped his arm around his son, and while his son buried his face in his father's shoulder and cried, they walked the rest of the way until they got to the finish line. And when they got to the finish line, 65,000 people stood up, and they cheered Derek Redmond and his father like he had just won the race. But he didn't win that race. In fact, he never raced again. That was the end of his career. But he persevered. And in the end, that made him a hero. Folks, he couldn't have done it without his father, though, could he? He'd have never made it to the end of that race without his father. His father loved him enough to come out of the stands, put his arm around him, and help him to the finish line. Folks, that describes our situation as believers. You see, we're flailing and falling on the track. Some of it's due to our own sin and failure. Some of it's due to what the enemy and how it's attacking us. But we've got a father who came down for us, who sent his son to 
come and rescue us while we were helpless, while we were enemies. He proved his love for us and that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. But then that wasn't enough. He helped us up and he's walking with us in this race. And every time we fall, he's lifting us back up and he's helping carry us toward the finish line. Folks, there are a lot of people that need to get back in the Christian race, that have fallen off the track, that have given up hope. And I'm telling you, Jesus is there to help you. Help is on the way. Even now, he sees what you're going through, and he wants to get you back in the race. It makes me think of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It's one of my favorite passages. It says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Folks, here's the good news. Jesus has already completed the race. And because he has completed the race, he can help us get to the finish line. If we'll just keep our eyes fixed on him. And here's the good news. So many times we think that we've messed up so bad that there's no need to get back in the race because we can't win. Right? Oh, man, I've messed up my life too bad. There's no, way that, there's no way that I even need to be out there running with all those other people. They're so much better than me. I, I love how Paul ended his last epistle in 2 Timothy 4. This is, he wrote this letter right before he was executed for his faith. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, Paul, I believe, I believe personally, was the greatest Christian that ever lived. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. He planted most of the churches in the ancient world. And uh, he was just an amazing man. But I want you to notice he didn't say, I won the fight or I won the race. He just said, I fought well and I finished. And I kept the faith to the end. That's it. Folks, that's all God expects of us. That's all God expects of us. He's not expecting you to be the greatest Christian that ever lived. He's not expecting us to be the greatest church that ever was. All he wants us to do is be faithful and keep running until the race is over. So my question for you today is do you have assurance of salvation and the power and protection that comes with knowing Christ? Because you'll never get in the race if you don't have that. You'll never get in the race unless you have that assurance I mean, what a wonderful thing to think that God would send his son Jesus to come and die so that we could live forever. To die in our place, that horrible, wretched death on the cross, so we could live forever with him. Folks, if you don't have assurance of salvation today, come to Christ. Come to Christ. Let him give you that assurance of knowing that he died for your sins, that he paid the price so that you could be saved. Confess your sin to him. Turn to him and let him be Lord of your life. And that'll give you the freedom to run. Second, will you trust Jesus enough to let him help you to the finish line even though you don't see how you can take another step? Whether it's the fact that you've messed up something really bad in your life and you just don't see how he could take you back. Or, or whether it's just that Life is beating you down, man. You're struggling because it just seems like the weight of the world is on you, whether it's family stuff, job stuff, marital stuff, whatever it might be. It just seems too much. I want you to understand Jesus can help you to handle it. Jesus can enable you to finish your race well. And finally, are we taking advantage of the opportunities that God gives us to be a witness for him and storing up treasures in heaven, or are we missing them because we're comfortable with life on earth? Folks, each of us need to ask ourselves that question. Am I taking advantage of the opportunities God gives me? We as a church need to pray and ask God, are we taking advantage of the opportunities that God is giving to us? Folks, let's be a light in a dark world. It doesn't matter how great we are, how big we are, how many numbers we might have, because you know what? It only takes a little light to dispel a whole lot of darkness. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, that, um, thank you that you've entrusted us with something as precious as the gospel when we're clearly weak and insufficient and unable to 
to do anything on our own. But Lord, you are running with us. Lord, we do not run alone. We thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for the hope that we have of eternal life. Thank you that we know help is on the way, that you are coming to rescue us. And it may be after our lifetimes, but that's okay because we'll go to be with you before that happens. But Lord, help us to remember that you are faithful and trustworthy and we can depend on you. Lord, there are people here today who are struggling. Lord, with personal issues, job issues, family issues. Lord, so many different things. Lord, I pray that they would turn to you for help. I pray that they would find that your grace is sufficient. Lord, I pray if there are any here who do not know you today, Lord, that you might save them. Lord, that they would, that they would truly recognize that they need you in their life. Lord, for believers that are here today, Lord, I pray that we would open our eyes to see what you're doing around us. That we would take advantage of the opportunities that you present us with to tell people about you that we might make a difference in our world for your kingdom. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Got a few announcements before we leave today. Um, personnel committee, uh, we are meeting in the men's Sunday school room uh, immediately following the service, so don't forget about that if you're on the personnel committee. Uh, today at 5 o'clock, the youth will meet, and then at 5.30, team kid. Uh, deacons, we are meeting at 7 o'clock tonight, don't forget about that. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock will be the second half of uh, the uh, movie It's All Cookie Dough about Marizzo. Uh, ministries in Kentucky that we'll be going to work with uh, next week. So hope to come out and join us for that. Immediately following that on Wednesday night, we're going to have a meeting for those who are planning on going to Kentucky the 24th through the 27th. So 
If you're interested in going on that trip, please be here Wednesday night uh, so we can uh, talk about details about that trip, which will be a week from Wednesday. Uh, there is limited room because there's only so many places to stay right now up there. Um, and so we need, to, we need to have an exact count. So this Wednesday is the deadline if you're wanting to go. Uh, also, don't forget, you can give donations towards the disaster relief, and the church is matching that dollar for dollar. I know that we've already had a good amount come in. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. Please continue to give. That will be an ongoing work that lasts for years, as we've seen from our flooding in eastern North Carolina. So we'll close today with some really good news. Uh, Grant and Barbara Payne uh, and, uh, and Christy Blaylock have come to move their membership from Mount Harmony Baptist Church to Barry's Grove Baptist Church, which just means they're coming home because they used to be members here several years ago. And so we're very excited about them being back with us. And so I hope that you will come and speak to them and encourage them and just let them know that you'll be praying for them in the days ahead. And uh, we thank God that we have an opportunity uh, to minister to people. And God adds to our number to be able to do that. Amen? Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Have a blessed day. Thank you.